Welcome to Grace Online at Grace Community Church in Gresham, Oregon. We're so glad you joined us today. For more information about who we are, go to gracecc.net. To stay connected with us, like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Hello, Grace family. Welcome. Happy Sunday. We're glad you're joining us today. Uh, my name is Steven Anderson. I'm the middle school student ministry leader here at Grace. And before we get started, before we get to hear from God's word and be able to worship together, which I'm so excited about, just had a couple things I want to share with you guys. Thank you so much for your generous giving at the last food drive that we had here at the church. We had so many people come out and give toward that, which is such a sweet way to be able to connect and serve our community. Our next one is going to be on July 18th. It's a Saturday from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So make sure to put that on your calendars. Next thing, we are so excited as we move forward toward our VBS this summer that's going to look a little bit different. It's not happening here. It's happening in your homes. So be considering uh, what friends, family, neighbors you want to invite to join you in your home uh, to participate for that. Uh, the registration is now open for the resources, and I have seen the resources, and they are fantastic. So we are so excited for that. Next week, on July 5th, we're going to be adding a service streaming time at 8.45 in the morning. Uh, this is going to be alongside our normal 10.45 service and our 2 p.m. Spanish-speaking service. Uh, so if you want to join us for that, we're going to be having a virtual interactive lobby on Facebook at 8.30 and at 10.30 before our 8.45 and 10.45 services. So make sure to join us then. Lastly, uh, we had a significant need arise in the last few days that the church acted quickly to be able to help with. Uh, this was with uh, Sudanese refugees and a food crisis. We're going to show you a video from Gary Bashirs uh, that will tell you a little bit more about this. When I was in Kampala about a year and a half ago, I met some just absolutely amazing people. One of them was Moses Andruga. He is a South Sudanese pastor who's literally been bombed out of his house along with thousands and thousands of others mostly Christians, and they're in refugee camps in northern Sudan, completely dependent on UN handouts, UN food allocations for their very survival. It's just horrible beyond words. Well, in the COVID crisis, the UN cut the food allotment by 40%, already at starvation level. They gave them three months worth of food because it's so difficult to transport People starving to death, they didn't understand that it was three months worth of food, it had been one month before, and now they're starving. I mean, literally starving. We at Grace have decided we will help out as a part of our emergency missions fund. Sherry and I are going to help out. And this is maize flour, beans, cooking oil, salt, just basics of life. And if you'd like to contribute to this, we'd encourage you to do that. Mending the Soul, just search for it in your browser, Mending the Soul. Under the give, designate for South Sudanese relief, and it will go directly without any administrative fee to be distributed through churches. So it'll be accountable, it will get to people, it'll be actually food to save people from starving. Thank you, Gary. As we consider other ways that we can give toward what God is doing in our community and around the world, I want to welcome you to consider your offering toward the mission and vision of Grace Community Church this week. There are several ways to give. You can drop it off, mail it in, or you can do it online. So I want to pray over the offering for this week. God, I thank you for the opportunity that we have to join you in what you are doing in our community and around the world. Uh, I pray over the offering for this week, over the financial gifts um, from our community um, to be able to help in the resourcing of what you are doing. Uh, I pray that you will uh, use these resources for your glory, um, that if we are wanting to use them for anything that you do not want to, that you'll make that clear um, and that they will go toward uh, your will and your plan uh, for our community and for around the world. Thank you again. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning, Grace Community Church family and friends and guests. We are so glad that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. And this morning, we're mixing things up a little bit, and we are going to dive right into God's Word together. So I'd like to pray one more time as we, as we open His Word together. Lord, again, thank you for each person who is watching this or who will be watching and listening to this in the future. And we ask that once again, through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would make your Word come alive to us that we can see you for who you really are, hear your voice speaking into our hearts and lives, and that we would have hearts willing to respond, to trust and obey, and to be the people in the community 
that you are calling us to be. We love you. We commit this time to you. In Jesus' name, in your name, amen. So it was this time many years ago that my wife, were, my wife and I were selling one house and preparing to buy another. And I'll never forget in that process when we got a phone call from the inspector of the house that we were purchasing and he was on the other end of the line and he said, yeah, you know, there's, there's something we got to talk about. And I said, okay. And he said, well, um, we need to talk about the foundation of your house. And I said, okay, so what's, what's going on with the foundation of this, this new house that we're, we're buying? He said, well, we found some water under there and we need to call in an expert to make sure that the foundation is solid and that there aren't any problems there. And, and you know, that makes sense. That's logical. But I was wrestling with that for a little bit because the house we were leaving didn't have a crawl space under the foundation. I mean, yes, it had a foundation, but it was what was called slab on grade. They had taken some gravel, compacted it, and then poured concrete on it. And so there was nothing to look at. There was nothing to crawl underneath. It was just concrete with a house built on top of it. So I wasn't accustomed to really being concerned about what a foundation looked like. But as it turns out, the good news was it was just some rainwater that had gotten down under there after a particularly hard rainstorm and that there weren't any any water problems or any erosion problems with the foundation. But as I was thinking about that story and that experience, I realized there was some wisdom in that. Wisdom for all of us. Periodically, we should all examine our foundations, especially the foundation of our faith. And that is where this passage in the book of Numbers, Numbers 20, is going to take us this morning, is it's going to cause us to reflect on what really is the foundation of our faith and how strong is that foundation? Because in this passage, we're going to see two extremes. We're going to see some epic examples of faith, and we're going to see some profound examples of faith failing or of failure. And all of that is wrapped up in these 13 verses that we're about to look at together. So if you haven't been with us, we have been following this story of God's people after they have been delivered by God out of slavery in Egypt. He has promised to bring them to this land that he promised to their ancestors thousands of years before. They've been on this journey through the wilderness. If you were with us last week, you remember that they came right to the edge of this promised land and they refused to go into it. They refused to believe God for what he promised and therefore God had to punish them. And now they have been wandering in the wilderness, in the desert for 40 years. And once again, they come to the edge of the promised land. And this is what happens. If you have a Bible, please open to Numbers chapter 20, verses one through 13. As we always do, we'll project this on the screen as I read it to you. And here we go. In the first month, the whole Israelite community arrived at the desert of Zin, and they stayed at Kadesh. There, Miriam died and was buried. Now, there was no water for the community, and the people gathered in opposition to Moses and Aaron. They quarreled with Moses and said, If only we had died when our brothers fell dead before the Lord. Why did you bring the Lord's community into this wilderness? that we and our livestock should die here. Why did you bring us up out of Egypt to this terrible place? It has no grain or figs, grapevines or pomegranates, and there is no water to drink. Moses and Aaron went from the assembly to the entrance to the tent of meeting, and they fell face down. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. And the Lord said to Moses, take the staff, and you and your brother Aaron gather the assembly together. Speak to that rock before their eyes, and it will pour out its water. You will bring water out of the rock for the community so that they and their livestock can drink. So Moses took the staff from the Lord's presence just as he commanded him. He and Aaron gathered the assembly together in front of the rock, and Moses said to them, listen, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? And then Moses raised his arm, and he struck the rock twice with his staff. Water gushed out. And the community and their livestock drank. But the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not trust in me enough to honor me as holy in the sight of the Israelites, you will not bring this community into the land I give them. 
These were the waters of Meribah, where the Israelites quarreled with the Lord and where he is proved holy among them. So now let's back up to the beginning of this passage and begin to work our way through it. So we're told some pretty important details in the opening verse that really set the stage in the scene for what we just saw unfold before us. This is like deja vu all over again. Because if you were with us last week in Numbers 13 and 14, this is the very same place 40 years earlier where the people had come to the edge of the promised land and basically revolted and refused to go into it and had forced God's hand to punish them. So there's some foreshadowing going on here. And there's a question that hangs in the balance. Most of this generation who rebelled those 40 years earlier have died. And so this is a mostly a new generation that once again is on the edge of the promised land. And how will they respond? Will they do any better than their ancestors that had preceded them? But it also tells us that Miriam, Aaron and Moses' sister, has now died. And that also is significant because it reminds us that this community has been experiencing death probably on a daily basis for the last 40 years. Numbers tells us that the census, that the number of the men who would come out of Egypt was around 600,000. And now as you begin to account for women and children and non-Israelites who had also chose to go with the nation when they left Egypt, you're probably talking about around two and a half million people, most scholars believe. And so if you begin to do math over the course of 40 years with two and a half million people, as they're wandering in this wilderness, wandering in this desert, you literally have people, sometimes scores of people dying every day. So for the last 40 years, these people have seen daily death, desolation, dryness, barrenness, ugliness. There's more than just symbolism going on here. Life has been really, really hard. And now their hearts are broken once again because one of their leaders, Miriam, who in fairness caused her share of trouble earlier in Numbers 2 for Moses, now now she dies. So what's going to happen? Well, they've been, as a people, at least in their history in this place before, not just on the edge of the promised land, but we know in Exodus 17, when God first led them out of Egypt and they had no water in the wilderness, They cried out to God for water. He commanded Moses to strike a rock, not to speak to it, but to strike a rock and bring water from the rock. And so surely this new generation had heard the story of how God had miraculously provided water. God had done this before. They were set up to succeed. They were set up to truly embrace what God said with full trust and faith. And what did they do? They not just grumbled. They didn't just complain. They actually fought against Moses. In fact, this is even a darker picture in some ways than what we saw last week when the people were grumbling about the land that God had brought them to. Now they're accusing Moses of all of their problems and difficulties. It's his fault they have no water. It's his fault they're wandering in the wilderness. In some ways, this is like Groundhog Day all over again. This is like a bad movie that keeps replaying itself. We just saw this last week in Numbers 13 and 14, and here they are again. And this time, they're not just arguing with Moses, they're blaming him. And once again, it feels like there's gonna be an open revolt, just like it almost came to that point in Numbers 13 and 14. And that's why this place was called Meribah, because that means quarreling. So Moses and Aaron, once again, had a fight on their hands. Now, here's a question for you and me. If you and I were Moses, how would you respond to this? After 40 years of hearing the complaining and the criticisms and the backbiting and the attacks and the slander and the gossip, wouldn't you just say, I'm out, I'm done. I've had enough of these people. But that's not what Moses and Aaron do, is it? What do they do? They, they go to God for help and for hope and for perspective. That's what their actions are telling us here. 
they, they go to God in humility and they cry out to him. And once again, God appears to them and he tells them exactly what to do. And we see that, I highlighted it here in the passage for you. Okay, the instructions, pretty straightforward. Take your staff, check. Take Aaron with you, check. Gather the people, got it. Speak to the rock, okay. And bring water out of the rock, got it. Pretty clear, not a lot of ambiguity there. So what happens? Well, Moses takes the staff, check. Takes Aram with him, check. Gathers the people, check. And yells at the people, what? Listen, you rebels. Did God tell him to say that? And the answer is no. And there is a lot swimming around in this. I mean, this, this is pregnant with meaning. Because what he's basically saying is, listen, you punks, I am done with you. Clearly, he's, he's done. He's reached the end of his patience with them. But that's not all that happens. It says that he says, must we? Now, is he talking about God and Aaron and him or Aaron and him? It, it's kind of hard to know. Is, is he taking credit where he shouldn't? Okay, we, we're not really sure about that. But this we do know, he strikes the rock twice. Now, what did God tell him to do? Speak to the rock, not strike the rock. Well, isn't that just splitting hairs? I mean, it is, it's not that big of a deal, isn't it? Well, in fairness, we all kind of know the difference between speaking and striking, don't we? Let's go back to preschool. In preschool, that's where I think I learned the difference between hitting someone and talking to someone. It happened out on a playground at my preschool. There was a little kid that I was playing with who took my dump truck from me. And I said, give it back. And he said, no. And so I began to cry. And my sister, who happened to be a year older than me, and I won't tell you which of my five sisters it was to protect her identity, my, my sister, um, she saw him do this and she walked over and she said, give my brother his truck back. And that little kid looked right at her and said, no. And so she hit him in the nose, gave him a bloody nose and gave me my truck back. Now, the great thing for me was it got results. But was that the best choice? Uh, no. Big difference between speaking to someone and then hitting them or speaking to a rock and hitting the rock. Now, we don't exactly know what was going on with all this, but this is what we do know is that Moses, Moses, this incredible example of faith all throughout the book of Numbers, who time and time again, humbly, gratefully, willingly goes to God, seeks God, obeys God, does exactly what God wants him to do, is zealous and defensive and protective of God's reputation, who is this incredible example of faith, he fails. Now, the people have failed all along the way. Miriam failed. Aaron failed. And now the last person you would expect fails. And, and how does God respond? He says, you didn't trust in me. You didn't honor me as holy. Now, we can speculate about all those indicators we just talked about, striking the rock instead of speaking to it, saying, we, what are you putting us up to to, to do this? And, um, you know, the, the, the other things there in the passage that seem to indicate he was angry, whether he was angry or not really isn't the issue. The issue is he didn't do what God asked him to do. And therefore, he was wrong. Because at the end of the day, faith is all about trusting and obeying God, it's, it's both. And just so we're on the same page, when we talk about faith, a, a simple de definition of faith is believing that God can be trusted. Or to put it another way, faith is believing that whatever God says can absolutely be trusted. And yet Moses isn't doing that. Somehow when he struck that rock, he, he, he struck God. He struck at God's reputation. And he wasn't trusting and obeying. And it's, it's hard to get our hands around this. And this is one of those passages that you, you read it and you go, I mean, really? 
I mean, do we really appreciate what happened here? He lost the promised land because of what he did here. His entire life, he's been longing for, waiting for, expecting and anticipating going with the people into the promised land. And this is the point where he loses that privilege and that blessing because of what he did. And at face value, we can look at this and say, it's a rock, not a person. It's not like he hit a kid like one of my sisters did. He hit a rock. Was it really that big of a deal? Well, to God, it was a big deal. And again, this is speculation. We don't know this for sure, but some scholars have pointed out as you look at Moses' life, there is a pattern, though, that, that's been building. For those of you who know the story of his life, when he was, when he was in Egypt, before he had identified with and joined with the, the Israeli people, the Jewish people, when he was still considered and acting like an Egyptian, he came upon an Egyptian beating one of the Israelites and he killed the guy and then hid the body and then went on the run as a fugitive. And then when he did lead the people out of Egypt into the promised land, brings them to, the, to Mount Sinai, goes and meets with God on top of the mountain. He tells them not to worship idols. He comes down the mountain with the Ten Commandments and what are they doing? They've create an idol and they're worshiping it. And he's so angry, he breaks the Ten Commandments. Where does it say that God told him to do that? And then, in punishing the people, disciplining the people, after they had committed this idolatry, he grinds up the idols and it says he mixed it up and made them drink it. Where did it say that God told him to do that? Well, it, it doesn't. The point is, you see this pattern with Moses, and maybe it's a pattern of anger. I, again, we're speculating here. We, we don't know for sure. This is one of the things that's, that's been tossed out there. But I do think there's merit to thinking about this in terms of brokenness and sin. You see, rarely does a failure of faith come down to a single moment. It's rare that it's a single defining moment that leads to this epic example of, of brokenness. By way of example, is there anyone who ever sets out as a life goal to say, you know what, someday I'm gonna be the most critical, bitter person you'll ever know. Or you know what, I'm gonna be a gambling addict someday. And then one act happens and they're a gambling addict. Or someone says, you know what, pornography is the life for me. I'm gonna become addicted to porn someday. Or, you know what, I am going to, you know, go have an affair because I really think that's what's best for me. And so that's what I'm going to do. You know, I'm, I'm going to extreme extremes here. And if I'm touching pain points in your life or someone you love, that, that is not my intention. And I, I am not trying to contribute to your pain. But what I am trying to point out is that there's usually a pattern. There's usually a progression of brokenness that leads to failures of faith. It's not something that most of the time happens overnight. There's a progression there. And I do think that's something that we need to pay attention to and that we need to extract from this passage is that we have to examine our hearts. Are we truly trusting and obeying God? Are you trusting and obeying God with the choices you're making in your life this morning? Because it's important that we understand that faith is also about our actions and our hearts. It is a both and. God's instructions matters, mattered, but so did Moses' motives. It reminds me of something that happened this last week. I had bought a battery at this store, and I won't tell you what store it was, but I bought a battery for my car at the store because my old battery kept dying. So bought a new one, took it home, put it in, and two days later the battery was dead. This brand new battery. So I recharged it, hooked it up again. A couple days later, died again. Did the same thing four times. And so I tested some of the components on my car and came to the conclusion that it was a bad battery. It had some damaged cells. It was never going to work the way it was intended to. It was defective, so I was going to take it back. So I took it back to the store, and after some wrangling with them, they reluctantly gave me a refund, and I realized as I went out to my car and began to drive away, they had given me too much money back. 
And so I had this dilemma and this conversation that began to take place. What do I do about this? I mean, they're not going to know if I keep the money, but I do. And is my integrity for sale for $12? Well, no. Now for 20, I might, no, just kidding. But for $12, really? And so it bothered me. And I'm glad it bothered me because I think that was the Holy Spirit saying, Jay, this isn't right. Your heart's not right and your actions are not right. And so earlier this week, I went back to the store and gave him the money. Because faith is about not just what's in our heart, it is also about what we do. It's a fusion of both. You see, God is just as concerned with who we are as he is about what we do. And so as we invite the worship team to come, and as we respond to music worship, and afterwards we'll return to this passage and and finish it out, but as we prepare to, to do this together, I want to encourage you to think about this song. As we ask God to give us faith, will will you be sincere in that? Not just sing these words, but truly invite him to give you the faith that you need to trust and obey him, not just with what you do, but with your heart as well. So let's worship together.
flesh will fail. The people wanted water and the people were thirsty. So Moses went to the rock, but disobeyed. Moses failed. His flesh failed. But God provided it in the midst of disobedience. And it just made me reflect on my own life, how much God provides in the midst of my disobedience. Well, I was thinking about this, and we're going to sing a new song to us. It's probably familiar to you. It's kind of an older one, um, but we haven't sang it before, and it's called All Who Are Thirsty. And it just made me think about this story about how they were thirsty, so they wanted water. And even though Moses disobeyed, water was still given to them. Well, in the New Testament, Jesus says, I am the living water. And... That's what we need to come to him with this morning, is asking him for that living water. Maybe some of you are at that point that you just need to ask, that you're thirsty and you need him to come. So use this song as a prayer. Say, come, Lord Jesus, come. Holy Spirit, come into my life. Because since he provides, as Jesus Christ is the living water, all we have to do is come to him and ask.
Thank you, Sarah and worship team. Thank you for the truth of what that song and those songs really do call us to. We want to be about trusting God and obeying him. That is at the heart of what faith is all about. And we want to pick up really where we left off with this passage, that God is just as concerned about who we are as he is about what we do. Which means if we define faith that way, it means that who we are and what we do matters. Now, some of you might think, and I think reasonably so, didn't we just cover this in talking about 
faith includes our actions and our hearts. But I think there's more work for us to do with this as we think about what it is that we see in this story with Moses and, and with the people. Because God ultimately is concerned, most concerned really, with our, with our spiritual health, our spiritual vitality, with our relationships. Jesus himself said in Matthew 22 that you could summarize all of God's word into two commands, two values, two ways of life, loving God and, and loving others. It all comes down to that, which means that our doing ultimately flows out of our being, which I think you could fairly say God is probably more concerned with who we are than he is with what we do because one flows out of the other. Think about this story that we're learning from with me. The point wasn't just getting to the promised land. It's easy to read numbers and sometimes I find myself doing this. I'm reading it going, geez, are you guys ever gonna get your act together? Are you ever going to enter the promised land? And yet the promised land really wasn't the point. At the end of the day, what it ultimately comes down to is the point was about right relationship with God. They weren't wandering in the wilderness just because God was rightfully punishing them after giving them multiple chances to trust and obey him. He wasn't just punishing them by having them wander in that desert, in that wilderness. He was preparing them. He was preparing them for what was going to come their way and at that point they weren't ready for it. I mean, think about this with me. What happened, for those of you who know your Bibles or who have read in Joshua, when they actually do come into the promised land? One of the first things they have to do is they have to cross the River Jordan. Now, I've been to Israel. I've seen the River Jordan. And most of the year, in most seasons, and when we saw it, if you went to the right place, it was a river you could reasonably cross with a mass of people and livestock and what have you. But during flood stage, which is when they came to it to enter the promised land, there's no way you're getting around that river. You just have to wait it out until the waters receded. And yet, what does God tell them to do in Joshua 3? He says, take the ark of God into the water. Now that represents the very presence and power of of God, and it makes absolutely no sense that they are going to walk into this river that is flooded, that is dangerous. This isn't just, you know, like getting their ankles wet. He tells them to get into the river. That makes absolutely no sense. And yet, when they did, it tells us that God performed a miracle very similar to what he did when he freed them from Egypt. When he parted the Red Sea, it says the water stacked up of the River Jordan and they were able to walk on dry ground through it. But at that point, it made no sense for them to try to cross it. And then as you go deeper into Joshua, in Joshua 5, I think it is, yeah, in Joshua 5, they're told to conquer the city of Jericho and they're told to do it by walking around it seven times. For seven days, they are to walk around it and play the trumpets. Now, Enter that story for a minute. How ludicrous, how silly, how ridiculous does that sound? What if you were one of those people walking around this city for no apparent reason other than God told you to? It makes no sense. And yet, at the end of that seven days, what happens? The walls fell down and they were able to take the city. If God wouldn't have miraculously done that, probably wouldn't have had any chance of taking that city. I've been to Jericho. I've seen it. It's the oldest city that we know. It is the oldest civilization that we know of. There are thousands and thousands of years of civilization built on that city, layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And yet, God told them to walk around it seven times before they could conquer it. In each of those cases, God told them to trust him in a way that sounded silly and ridiculous and ludicrous. So, if they weren't enter, ready to enter the promised land, they weren't ready to trust God in the ways they would need to in order to take hold of that land. So they didn't just wander in that desert out of punishment. 
They wandered in that desert as well so that God could prepare them so that their being, who they were, their relationship with him could be developed and ready for when they needed to step out and trust and obey him for the future things that God had for them, which now brings us to me and you. How is your relationship with God this morning? Does your doing flow out of your being when it comes to your relationship with him? Now let's take that a little further. Are you busy? If me or someone else were to ask you how you're doing, how many of us would say, I'm doing good or however we're doing and then we'd follow it with, yeah, I'm really busy. Is there anyone who's not busy? And in fairness, it's a good thing to be busy. We should leave productive, fruitful lives, whatever adjective you want to hang on that. But how busy should we be truly? I mean, everybody I talk to says they're busy and usually really busy. Students are really busy. Collegiates are really busy. Young adults are really busy. Single people are really busy. Married people are really busy. People with kids are really busy. People with adult kids are really busy. People with grandkids are busy. People who are retired are busy. And so it goes. Is there any one of us who doesn't identify ourselves as being busy? But in that busyness, are you cultivating? Do you have time? Do you make time for intimacy with God? Are you loving God by spending time with him? The heart of the matter is a matter of the heart. You see, for me, COVID has thrown a wrench into my, into my life and my schedule, probably like most of you. Working from home has been a, a real challenge for me because my days have elongated. They're, they're longer. And I love being with my family. But the clear lines of me leaving for the day and coming back that night or leaving for that night and coming back really late at night, those, those are gone. And I've had to completely reinvent how I pursue my love relationship with God, how I spend time with him, how I cultivate intimacy with him, how I make sure that my doing is flowing out of my being and I'm not just being hectic and busy and harried and going from thing to thing to thing. It's been a real challenge for me. And yet it's so important that what we do flows out of who we are. And I would venture to guess that for a number of you, this is a season where that's really being challenged. But it's so fundamental because God is just as concerned about who you are in him as he is about what you do for him. But let's shift gears to the second commandment, loving other people. So how are you doing with that? How does your faith shape that and inform that and drive that and motivate that? And once again, this is a place where I think there can be a disconnect for us. I think sometimes in our relationships, we can be, you know, critical or negative or even unforgiving or neglectful or even in extreme examples, abusive. And we don't really see a problem with that. And I've seen that disconnect, that brokenness in people over the years as a pastor a number of times. It's like we compartmentalize. We think that our relationship is fine and yet our actions prove other, otherwise. And we can become blinded to that. It's like we have this same spiritual amnesia that we saw the people had last week, and in many cases, we see it again in this story today. They forget what God has done for them. They forget who they are. They forget his power. They forget his presence. They forget his promises, and they act out of brokenness instead, and their relationships suffer as, as a result. So at the end of the day, faith is about who we are and about what we do. But you know, there's something so compelling to me in this 
in this story that we see. The last person we would ever expect to fail, Moses, fails. And he fails epically. He loses the promised land as a result. And yet, what is it that we don't see in this story with how Moses responds to his God? When God says, because you did not trust me, because you did not regard my name as holy, you will not enter the promised land, what does it say Moses' response was there? Does it say he was embittered? Does it say he was angry? Does it say he was defensive? Does it say that he made excuses? Does it say he shifted blame on Aaron? Does he deny that he did anything wrong? All of that is conspicuously absent from the passage. And I think it's because Moses humbly accepted the consequences of his selfishness, of his sin, of his brokenness, but then submitted to God because his foundation of faith was still still strong. Because you see, my friends, we're not defined by our failures. If you know Jesus Christ, every day is a new day in him. His word declares there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. This God gives multiple chances. He's so full of grace and he loves us so much. And that's not a license to live selfishly or or to be proud of our brokenness or to wallow in our sin. It's an escape from all that, really. And what we see here in Moses is something so profound and so fundamental for us to walk away with from this passage. And it's this, that faith builds its foundation on the one who will never fail. Because one of the central messages in this story we're looking at today is the people fail once again. Wow, that's a surprise. That's a shocker. No, the people failed all throughout this journey. Miriam fails. Aaron fails. And Moses fails. Everyone in this story fails except one person. And that's God. And there is a deeper symbolism, a deeper significance that Sarah alluded to and spoke to earlier in our time this morning that's taking place in this passage. We actually fast forward now hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years, actually over a thousand years, to the New Testament, to the letter to the Corinthian church where it gives us further insight into what was going on in this passage. And this is what it says. This is the Apostle Paul writing to this church. And he's talking about this very story and this very history we've been looking at these last several weeks. He says, For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, he's talking to the church, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. That's a specific allusion and reference to the Exodus and to God guiding them through the Red Sea and to Mount Sinai. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. That's talking about how they had submitted themselves to Moses' leadership, that they were following him, much like when someone chooses to follow Jesus Christ and submits to his authority and leadership in their life, they get baptized. That's what that's alluding to. It says they all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. Now, fasten your seatbelts, here we go. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them and that rock was Christ. The rock that Moses struck was symbolic of the power and the presence and the provision of God, yes, but in a very powerful, real way, it was the reality of God himself was with them. That their deepest physical thirst would be satisfied, but more importantly, their deepest spiritual thirst would be satisfied. And so once again, it brings us back full circle to what we started our time with here this morning in his word, and that is, okay, so let's inspect our foundations together. What is your your spiritual foundation this morning? Are you building your life on the rock? Are you following the way of Jesus Christ? Because right now, more than ever, our culture, our city, our world needs a community of Jesus followers who have their foundation rooted, built, established on the rock of Jesus Christ. 
Because in many ways, it feels like the foundation of our culture is, is falling apart. People are looking legitimately for hope. People are looking legitimately for that which is real, that which is enduring, that which is lasting. In many ways, that's, that's what our broken culture is looking for right now. And we're going to go deeper into this when we get into Numbers 21 with, with Sean next week. We're really going to take this for a test drive. But what we need really is a revolution. But we need something more significant that goes deeper and is more transformational than what we see happening in our culture right now. We need a revolution of the heart. We need to repent. We need to turn away from our brokenness and our sinfulness and our selfishness and the many things that come out of that, racism, injustice, prejudice, systemic unfairness. And we need to align our hearts with God's. We need to build our lives on his foundation. My friends, we do need a revolution. We need a revolution of the heart. The only thing that's going to bring lasting change and transformation into your life and mine is right relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's what we need. That's what this world needs. That's what our culture needs. And that's what we as a church need to be all about. Our foundation is built on the rock of Jesus Christ. Who he is, what he does, what he's done, what he will do, and what he promises to fulfill. And so my friends, as our worship team comes once again, and as we respond to what we've heard here this morning, to what we're learning together, you lock away the reality and the truth that this rock will not move. This rock will not change. That Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, he's the same today, and he is the same forever. And that's why we worship him. This rock never moves. This rock never fails. So let's sing about that.
And that is so true. And I hope you believe this, that he is the God who brings walls down. He is the God who moves mountains and he is the God who makes a way where there seems to be no way. He is that kind of God because he's real, because his promises are true, because he is near and because he wants us to build our lives on him, on what he promises, on who he is, on what he does. Is he your foundation this morning? If you're not sure, or if you don't think he is, do something about that. It starts with you receiving him into your life, inviting him into your life. Scripture declares over and over again, God is near. 
And he wants to get so near to you, he literally wants to live inside of you through the power of his Holy Spirit. He wants to enter into an intimate relationship with you through Jesus Christ, through his Spirit. And you get that by asking for it. And if you're not sure how to do that, we call that praying. It's just talking to God. And any one of us would love to do that with you. After our time today, you'll see come up on your screen a Zoom prayer room. And if you go to that um, on your whatever device you have, there are folks there who would love to pray with you. In fact, I'm going to pray with you here in just a minute. And for our church family who is watching here this morning, I know you to be a generous community. In fact, you're one of the most generous communities I've ever known. And if God has blessed you with the ability to help with the Sudanese refugee crisis, we ask and hope that you will do so. And I'm confident that we will as a community provide some real help there. But before I pray, let me leave you with these words from Jesus where he reminds us that our foundation of our life, the foundation of our faith, absolutely has to be him, where he says, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Would you pray with me as we prepare to end our time together here this morning? Lord, thank you that you are the God who is near to us. And you want to get so near to us that you want to come into our lives through the power of your Holy Spirit. You want us to build our lives on a foundation that is rooted in you as our rock as the one who never leaves us, as the one who always does what you promise you will do. And so, Lord, I pray for anyone who's watching or listening to this who isn't sure or who knows that you are not their rock, that you are not their foundation, that this morning they would make that certain and sure by talking to you, by asking you, whether it's with words or what they think with their heart, to come into their lives as their Lord and Savior. Lord, I pray that you would compel them to not wait any longer, but to enter into the life-changing, hope-giving relationship that only comes through knowing you and through you being our foundation. And Lord, I pray for all of us who do know you, that God, we would time and time again, every single day, moment by moment, hour by hour, make you our foundation. Would we build our lives on who you are, on what you say, and on what you promise. Thank you that you've been with us here this morning. Thank you that you now go with us through the power of your Holy Spirit. And it's in your name we pray. Amen. May God go with you and may you build your life on him and will you live your life for him. We'll see you next Sunday right here. Thanks for joining us for Grace Online at Grace Community Church in Gresham, Oregon. We're glad you were here with us today. If you have any questions or would like to know more about who we are, go to gracecc.net. To stay connected with us, like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel. 